All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good night. Depending on what part of the world you are joining us from, I am Alex Faust, your host of Conversations at the Edge, and I'm very excited to be joined here today by Professor John Mullins, who, if you're not already familiar and didn't have a chance to join our training last week, is an award-winning teacher, two-time entrepreneur, and associate professor of management practice in entrepreneurship and marketing at the London Business School. He brings over 20 years of executive experience and high growth retailing firms to his award-winning teaching and research, which in turn has yielded four books, as well as many articles and esteemed outlets, such as the Harvard Business Review and MIT Sloan Management Review. And his latest book, Customer Funded Business, which I have a copy of right here, um, is what we're going to be discussing today as he shares the five business models that successful companies are using to leverage customer funding for their growth. And it's also the key topic um, of the course that he teaches, the, uh, the Scaling Your Business Without Venture Capital, which is going to start in a couple of weeks here at Growth Institute. So, John, welcome to Conversations at the Edge. It's great to have you here. And where are you calling in from today? It's always great to see you, Alex, and uh, I'm happy we're going to have this conversation. I'm calling in from a little mountain town called Crested Butte, Colorado. Very nice. Well, I see uh, we have a couple of folks here from Colorado in the audience, so maybe they know uh, where whereabouts you are today. Yep. So I want to begin. Um, there are a lot of companies that live or die by their customers um, and or external funding, uh, but for some, external funding is not even on their radar. So I'm curious to understand if you can talk about from like a high level, why is external funding versus customer funding right for some and not for others? So that's a really good question, Alex. Um, I, I think growth capital or venture capital or private equity, whichever place in that, that private financing world is right to play, can be a really good thing uh, when a, when a company has a, a, a potentially high growth activity that it wants to fund, and when that activity is already clicking on all cylinders. So they've got product market fit and, and everything's working, but it needs more fuel. So that, that's one time when, when uh, growth capital of whatever sort, I think can make a lot of sense. Another time when it can make a lot of sense is when you're going to play a winner take all kind of foot race. You know, if you've got something where maybe the barriers to entry are low, but it's but it's um, uh, but but you've got a chance to be the winner. And if you go really fast, sometimes that means you've got to have the most uh, shekels in the game so, so that you get to the finish line first. And and I think. Uh, you know, private equity or growth capital for for a mid market company that wants to grow really fast and has an opportunity like that can make make sense there. But otherwise, um, customer funding is is far more appealing for a whole lot of reasons that we'll talk about here. Would you like to maybe go into the top one or two to just to get us going? Uh, sure, sure. So um, w- when you rate, it's it's, it's it's kind of like the big drawbacks with, with taking money from an investor. One of them is that it's a huge distraction because when, when you raise capital, that's a full-time job typically. And, and, and if you're spending your time raising capital, what are you not spending your time on? Well, you're not spending your time on, on your customer and trying to better understand the customer and figure out ways to, to better satisfy that customer. So the distraction is one thing. Second thing is... If you give away a piece of a piece of your your company to a to an investor, and that's why they'll invest because they get a piece of your company, that's a piece that you'd probably rather not have given up if you if you could find another way not to have to do that. And, and then a third drawback is the baggage that comes with outside capital. So there's a there's a term sheet you get when when you go out to raise money, and it looks pretty innocuous. And they tell you how much money they they're going to give you, and they tell tell you what kind of stake in the business they want. And then they have some things like other standard terms and conditions will apply. And then you sign the term sheet, and then you read uh, the next document you get, which is the shareholders agreement that might be 50, 60, 80 pages that has all these other terms and conditions in it. And I guarantee one thing: you will not like what it says. 
you know, it says they can control the board if you don't meet your targets, or they can fire you if you don't meet your targets, or various things like that. There's a lot of baggage, and there's a lot of meddling, you know, meddling in your business. And and uh, the person who probably knows best how to run your business is you. It may not be an investor who's a smart person, but may not fully understand uh, the challenges your business faces. So they're, they're really drawbacks to taking capital. And if you can get capital from your customers instead, and I don't mean investment from your customers, I mean getting them to pay you up front for revenue. If you can do that, you're not giving up any stake um, so, so the capital doesn't cost you anything, and and uh, and and it gives you clear, you know, market feedback that what you're trying to sell is something that the customer really wants. So, you know, lots of good reasons to to try to get customer funding if you can. But you know, the challenge is to get it, of course. Yeah, thank you. And just a reminder for the folks who are here live, if you have any questions for John, uh, please type them into the chat during the last 10 minutes. We'll get to your questions. Um, so John, I'm curious, what are some of the bigger mistakes that you're seeing leaders make when it comes to funding their growth, whether it be with their customers or with you know external VC or private equity firms? I, I think the biggest uh, the biggest mistake, Alex, is drinking the the private equity VC Kool-Aid. You know, there's the, uh, there are all the fantastic stories of all the wonderful companies that have been built that way. And, and sh sure, we'd all like to be Steve Jobs or, or Mark Zuckerberg and, and have that kind of backing and have the kind of success pe people like that have had. Um, but, but I think, uh, I think people don't, don't, CEOs don't think hard enough about how can I fund this business without that? You know, can I get debt? Can I get my customers to fund it? Because other forms of capital are much, much cheaper uh, and much less likely to inter interfere with the freedom. And, and uh, most people running mid-sized companies want that freedom, right? That's, that's why they're in that position. So, um, you know, I, I think that's the biggest mistake. It's just, just assuming that, well, oh, there's private equity money out there. It's money hanging on trees. I think I'll go get some. Thank you. So you talk about five customer models that you've seen, seen work extremely well for different types of companies. Can you give us a, an overview of what those five models are? And um, well, I guess yeah, let's sure. start there. Yeah. yeah. So, so the, the first one uh, we, we've seen a lot of, I call it a matchmaker model. Some people call it a marketplace. Some people call it a platform, but essentially what you're doing is you're bringing together buyers and sellers, but you're never touching or, or taking title to what is bought and sold. So in the online world, that's Airbnb and eBay and uh, you know Uber and all that kind of stuff. Uber doesn't own any cars, right? They, they just bring together drivers and riders who need a ride. Real estate brokers are using a matchmaker model, right? They don't actually ever own the house that is bought or sold but they bring together buyer and seller. And, and, if, and if you're in a matchmaker kind of business, you don't need inventory. You may not have any accounts receivable. So the working capital needs of that, of that kind of business are much, much less than many other kinds of business. So matchmaker is, is the first and maybe most obvious kind. The most straightforward kind is what I call a pay in, in advance model, where you simply get somebody to pay you in advance uh, in part or in full for what it is they're going to buy. Um, so imagine you're going to remodel your kitchen. You, you hire a kitchen designer and uh, the kitchen designer will say, well, we'll start work once we get the deposit, right? So with service businesses, almost always there's a pay in advance component, but that can be done in, in product businesses too, as Elon Musk does, right? You know, if, if you wanted to buy his uh, very first car, the Roadster, you had to put $100,000 down and then you had to wait. Uh, well, you know, that, that kind of money in advance is really nice to have. Uh, there are subscription models. That's the third kind where we subscribe to stuff. It might be organic veggies delivered to our doorstep. It, it might be uh, Netflix. In my case, it's the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times. When do we pay for subscriptions? We, we pay for them up front, right? And, and uh, then we pay for them perhaps over time if we don't pay on an annual basis. 
but we're getting the money up front and then the company has to has to deliver. Well, when that money comes up front, you can use some of that money to grow the business uh, in addition to using some of it to, to provide whatever it's whatever is being subscribed for. So that's three. The fourth one is what I call scarcity models. And, and that's where you limit what you, what you decide to sell. So Zara is a great uh, example that everybody on this call probably has a Zara store or is near them or has been in one of those stores. Zara, unlike Gap, where I used to work, Zara limits the amount of each style that it, that it puts in its assortment. So, so they limit it in two ways. They limit the quantity and they limit the time that it's there. So their fashionista customer has been trained that if they see something they like in a Zara store, they better buy it today because if they come back tomorrow, it's gonna to be gone. Well, that enables Zara to turn its inventory 12 times a year. Gap turns this into inventory four times a year, vastly different working capital model. And, and because Zara is turning its inventory 12 times and paying its suppliers in 60 days, by the way, it's got 30 days of float there to, uh, you know, to, to grow the business. So that's the fourth kind. And then the last one is what I call service to product models, where you start with a service and at some point, you say, well, gee, you know, this service could be packaged in a different way and sold without all the handholding or all the, the customization and, and you become much more scalable. And that's how Microsoft got started. Bill Gates and Paul Allen were writing operating systems for all the early PC makers. And pretty soon all of those operating systems look pretty much the same. And finally they said, well, gee, we don't have to keep hiring engineers to, to write code, to write yet another operating system that's gonna look like the other ones. Why don't we just write one oper operating system? We'll call it MS-DOS and we'll let people either download it with a PC or buy it in a shrink wrap box. And so the service that was developing a tailored operating system became a product, uh, MS-DOS, and that's when the value of Microsoft really took off. So those are the five models. There's a lot to deal with for how you implement them and the right ways to do that and the wrong ways to do that. But those are the five models. And, and uh, you know, there's nothing new about any of them. They've all been around a long time, but, but nobody's talked about them until now. Yeah. And I mean, at Growth Institute, we're using variations of all five. Yeah, uh, you are. Exactly. So we, we definitely... Um, reap the benefits of the customer funded business models and um, they, they work. So thank you for that. And I'm, I'm curious, John, are there certain models that you would or would not recommend for certain industries or certain types of, of businesses? Um, yeah, yeah, there are. So, so let's take the service to product model, for example. So uh, we're living in an increasingly service oriented economy, right? Um, so anybody running a service business can look at that business and say, is there something I'm delivering as a service today, like Microsoft was doing, that I could turn into a product that I could sell for a vastly lower price, probably to a different target market, right? Um, so, so Microsoft was charging hundreds of thousands of dollars to create a customized operating system. Well, MS-DOS was much cheaper because they only had to build it once. Um, so so a, a, a service business, I think, can look for what is it that I do that I could somehow put online or, or, or create, create a product that can be delivered and the customer can just use it. They don't need all, all the tailoring. Um, so, so that model fits every, every kind of service industry. Um, it's much more scalable because the problem with service industries when you try and scale them is every time you add a new chunk of business, you have to add a new chunk of people, right? So if you're a digital marketing agency, for example, and you get some more clients, now you need some more people to manage those clients. Well, it's hard to scale a business that way. It's much easier if you can figure out a product that you can scale um, that, that you just sell additional copies of. Um, I, I think pay in advance and subscription models apply to pretty much any business. You can always ask your customer to pay you in advance. And if you've got something really special 
that is better, faster, cheaper, whatever, than your competitors have, it's not unreasonable to ask your customers to, to pay you in advance for that product. If you don't have anything that's actually better than your competitors and you're just selling a commodity, my advice is figure out a way to get out of the commodity business. That's going to be a, be a hard way to make a living in the long run. But, but asking people to pay you in advance, for example, many, many kinds of businesses have ongoing service agreements, for example, or, or uh, warranty programs. Well, instead of having the customer pay, pay for those monthly in arrears, for example, have them pay you in advance uh, for a year. Well, that's going to vastly help your cash flow. Uh, and most customers will, will uh, be happy to do that. So pay in advance applies every, everywhere pretty much. Subscription models can apply in some industries. Uh, others, it's not so useful. Um, scarcity models work pretty much anywhere. So, you know, figure out how to make your product limited in time or in quantity. Um, so as, as Gazelles does, you know, there only, there's only space for 30 companies on a program, right? If you're company 31, sorry, you, you can't come. Your people can't come. You have to wait till next time. Uh, that motivates uh, customers to buy now. Thank you. So I'm curious, you know, how do you recommend if people are wanting to shift from a non-paying advance or subscription model, how do you kind of retrain you know, customers over time who've been used to one way now to start paying in advance when, especially today, you know, cash is limited and their pocketbooks are probably taking a hit from things like inflation and supply chain. How do we, how do we make that shift with our customers? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I don't recommend that a company that wants to begin this shift do it overnight with every single customer because some customers are going to be cash strapped and they're not going to be able to do it. But if we look at the large uh, publicly owned companies that we see traded on Wall Street, almost all of those companies are just a wash in cash. You know, they're doing share buybacks and they're, and they're paying out dividends because they have more cash than they need. Well, for, if, if you have a customer who's like that, it's not unreasonable to say, you know, I, I, I'd like you to, you know, pay me in advance for this instead of later. And, and again, you have to have something that they really want, but if you have that, it's, it's, it's not unreasonable at all to take a company that has cash and ask them to pay in advance. Now, if, if you've got an entrepreneurial startup that's struggling with its own cash, that's probably not a good you know, target customer to get you to pay upfront, but you, most companies will have some customers where it's eminently reasonable. Sometimes you can convince people that, you know, I'm protecting your budget, right? Especially when you sell to government clients, for example. Government people always want to use their budget because they're afraid they're not going to get it next year if they don't use it. Well, I can help you, you know, pay me for the whole year now, and that, that's going to make sure you get your budget next year. That's great. Thank you. And is there a model that you like best? Um, no, there isn't one that I like best. I mean, pay in advance is the most universal of them. In, in a sense, all of them are pay in advance uh, in, in that you're getting the customer's money early and you're trying to pay your suppliers later. Uh, but no, there's not one that I think is best. There, you, you, have to, you have to look at what you do and figure out where the opportunities are to apply one of these models and, and then do it. And you, and you can't do it everywhere, Alex, right? If you want to build a, a dam and a hydroelectric power plant in India, for example, to provide some electricity that India sorely needs, you probably can't customer fund that one, right? You got to build the dam and build the hydro plant before you can sell any electricity. So, you know, you got to think about where you sit and who your customer is and, and figure out, okay, which one of these can I put to work? Thank you. So right now the market is obviously all over the place and it looks like cash is really being taken out of the market. You've seen the articles from investment firms like Sequoia or the startup incubators like Y Combinator telling their communities to kind of prepare for the worst when it comes to cash and investment possibilities. So I'm curious what you're seeing in terms of growth capital and what you'd advise our community of entrepreneurs and CEOs uh, for this foreseeable future. 
um, yeah, I, th I think I think we're heading into a period where it's going to be exceedingly difficult to raise investment capital. Uh, so, so if I'm if 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 I were still a CEO today, uh, I'd be thinking about a couple of things. Number one, I'd be looking at my cost structure and asking myself, okay, what's in my cost structure that is not essential? or that maybe isn't paying for itself. What is it that we're doing today that we don't actually have to do? And I'm talking about activities. And you take an activity and you say, we don't have to do that activity or that activity isn't paying off. Let's take that off activity off our agenda. And that, that may mean taking some people off our, off our uh, org chart. So that's the first thing. Um, getting, getting a good look at your costs and figuring out where you are. The second thing I'd take a look at is your balance sheet, in particular, uh, your working capital items on your balance sheet. So your accounts receivable, your accounts payable, your inventory, different kinds of businesses may have other working capital items. And make sure you're managing those really well. And what I often find in, in, in the good times, and we've had good times for quite some time now, right? We, yeah, we went through the pandemic, but a lot of businesses did really well in that pandemic. When you've been in the good times, often you get a little lax. You're not collecting your payables as fast as you can. Maybe you get inventory a little bit bloated. Well, it's time now, I think, to pull the reins in on all that stuff and make sure your working capital numbers, your cash days, as I call them, are where they ought to be. That's the second key piece you need to do. The third piece you need to do, I think, is take a look at your gross margins and figure out uh, I'm, I'm, I may well have a, a downturn in revenue, right? We, we could have a recession looming. We don't know. Uh, we probably have one recession, one looming, but we have no idea when, when it's going to hit us. But if it hits, we're going to lose some top line revenue. So it would be helpful if we have an idea of where in our product mix we have some items that we could sell at somewhat higher gross margins. Maybe there's stuff that a certain target market is willing to pay more for then we're currently charging. So look for some opportunities to get some additional margin dollars because if revenue falls off, you may very well need those margin dollars as we go forward. So those are the three things that I think uh, CEOs should be looking at now. It's you got to get your house in order in, in all three of those ways. Thank you. And a little bit more on the importance of cash and, and cash flow here. Is there a specific goal that you recommend you know, CEOs and entrepreneurs are looking for in terms of their cash conversion cycle or working capital? Uh, yeah, there's something that I call uh, uh, cash flow nirvana uh, or working capital nirvana, and it's having a negative working capital on your balance sheet. That means you have more cash sloshing around in your account from your customers than you need to pay your suppliers bills today. So uh, a, a great example of that is Dell Computer. When Michael Dell started that business all those years ago from his dorm room at the University of Texas, the customer had to pay for the computer in advance. And what Dell would do then is he'd then go buy the parts and his buddies would assemble the computer. And that model continued for Dell all, all the way through. So, so Dell had the customer's money in advance up front. He didn't pay his suppliers for typically 30 days, the people who, had, who, who provided all of the parts from which he'd assembled a new PC and his working capital cycle was negative, okay? That means that your growth, that, that the constraint that your working capital imposes on you uh, is, is non-existent. You have an infinite cap uh, ability to grow from a working capital point of view. You, you, know, you, you may have other constraints that will constrain your growth, but cash will not be among them. So, so the answer to your, your question is I want the working capital cycle, or working capital balance to be negative, Alex. Uh, if I can't get it to be negative, I at least want it to be short. So the day I pay for whatever it is I'm going to sell, maybe it's some inventory, and, and the amount of time that I have to hold that and then sell it to my customer and then get paid by my customer, that total cash conversion cycle, I want that to be as short as I can be, as it can be. So 
uh, squeeze down the inventory days, squeeze down the payable days to zero or negative if they pay you in advance. And um, that's there's no single target, but it's as short as possible. And uh, if you're looking for Nirvana, you want it negative. Awesome. Thank you. So we have a, a question from the community here. Sid is asking, is there a creative way to fund new product development? Uh, yeah, there's a creative way. Uh, figure out who the customer is for the new product you want to develop and go to that customer. It might be a, a B2B customer, for example, and, and say, gee, gee, we've got this idea that, that we for a new product that we think will really help you do X, Y, or Z. Uh, here, here's how far we've developed it so far. Here's our prototype or whatever. Now I, I want to fully develop the rest of it for you. So it's going to work for you. And I need payment now to fund that. Um, no reason why you can't get customers to do that. And again, that's giving you market feedback. If the customer doesn't want to fund that, then maybe the product idea you have isn't so compelling as you think it is. But if it's really compelling and that customer you know just has to have it they'll pay you in advance to help you develop it thank you great question um so i'm curious you know what are you seeing in terms of good ways to educate you know not just the ceo about this but the whole leadership team the board and making these shifts in a way that people can be proactive about utilizing these customer funded models uh, I, I think a key thing that's helpful in doing that is to make the numbers in your business transparent. So I wrote a, an article a few years ago um, called, what did I call it? Are, are, your, are your cash flow numbers recession ready? Um, and, and essentially what I argued in that article is that what leaders ought to do is share with everybody in the business. I mean, everybody, your cash days of receivables, your cash days of payables, your cash days of inventory, and what of whatever other working capital numbers you have in your business. And let everybody see those numbers. Because if everybody sees those numbers and you can set KPIs that say, okay, we wanna get our receivables, for example, maybe you're running 40 days on your accounts receivable and your terms are net 30. Well come on, let's get that down to 30. Let's share those numbers with everybody in the business so that everybody who's involved, the salesperson who sells that customer, the receivables clerk who has to collect, collect that invoice so that everybody sees the numbers, everybody knows what the targets are and, and everybody helps manage the cash. So, so managing cash is really, it's not just the CFO's job. I think there's a a misconception sometimes that it's the CFO who manages the cash. CFO typically just measures what's happening with the cash. The people who manage the cash are the rest of the people in the business. And the way you can get them to do that better is to share the numbers with them. So they, they see them and every week or, or, or every month, you share certain numbers with them and say, how are we doing against, against our KPIs? Which ones do we have to improve? Which customers are a problem? Is there a reason we're willing to let that customer be a problem, for example, with a, a slow pay because they're giving us a lot of volume or maybe a lot of really high margin business? You know, it gives you a way to talk about it. But if you don't share the numbers, you don't have the basis on which to talk about it. Yeah, and Alan Miltz is a big proponent of that too with his, with his program and the power of one. He calls them chapter four meetings uh, that you run at least once a month with your leadership team to make sure that people know the numbers and understand how cash flow is being affected by everyday decisions. Mm -hmm. And how they themselves can then affect those decisions. Exactly. To make, to make the business healthier. Yeah. So John, we've only got one minute left. Um, any final pieces of advice or thoughts for our community today? I, I, I guess I would just say that, that most mid-market CEOs are running a business because they want to work for themselves. And, and uh, if, if they can get money to grow from their customers rather than from investors, they're going to retain the control that they love. They're going to retain the freedom that they love. Uh, and, and they're not going to have to spend time pandering to investors. So I think it's a, it's a powerful model. It's what many, many businesses do but now it's getting talked about and now we know what the five tools are to actually make it happen. 
Well, John, thank you so much for joining us today. Looking uh, very forward to having you join our community for the upcoming Scaling Your Business Without VC class, uh, which is starting in a couple weeks. And thank you to the community for joining us today. Thanks, everybody.